Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Establish, brought to you by Shake Up the Establishment. We are a youth run, nonpartisan, community centered nonprofit that focuses on translating knowledge within various topics of climate justice to make this information more accessible to those living in what is currently Canada. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that we have the privilege of living, working, and thriving upon land that Indigenous peoples have lived and cared for and continue to do so since time immemorial. We acknowledge that our address resides on Treaty 3 land, which is the territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabeweke, Attawandarok, Mississaugas, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This episode is part of a larger project called Voices of the Green Belt, consisting of five podcast episodes, a mini documentary, and visual workshops. This project has been supported by the Green Belt Foundation. The Green Belt Foundation's grant and research activities are made possible by the generous support of the government of Ontario. Such support does not indicate endorsement by the government of Ontario of the contents of this material. My name is Atreyu Lewis, I use they he pronouns, and I'm a two-spirit, transmasculine, non-binary, mixed indigenous, and racialized youth. I grew up in Toronto, and I am now currently situated in Jojage, also known as Montreal, Quebec. I am a public speaker, project manager, and grassroots leader with BIPOC organizations, as well as taking part in independent research on decolonizing methodologies, epistemologies, and promoting intersectionality and harm reduction. Today, in this episode, we will be speaking with Deborah McGregor, and we will be discussing biodiversity within the Green Belt. Thank you for joining us. Maybe can you speak to a little bit on biodiversity or conservation efforts in Ontario, in the Green Belt? Um, And do you think maybe historically the government has tried to keep people away from natural spaces? Has that changed at all? I think historically has always been about trying to keep people away. So not recognizing that people are actually part of the natural world. People are part of the ecosystem. People have relationships with the animals, birds, and whatever happens to live there. So there's this history. So I, th- I think it's a lot, it's sort of is so embedded that people don't even question it or think about it. If that area is to be conserved and we're trying to conserve the biodiversity, we can't go there. That's kind of what people think about um, biodiversity. And that's, I mean, that was the theory in practice, very hard to do that because you're building a highway right through, you know, a conserved area or an area that should be conserved. Definitely. Um, and for people who don't know, biodiversity is of several layers, genes, individual species, communities of species, ecosystems. Um, for Greenbelt regions, about 24% of it is in forests. And then 1%, 12% is wetlands. Um, most endangered are grasslands, which is really 1% of the Greenbelt. Um, so it's the Greenbelt really covers a lot of regions in Ontario, such as Oak Ridge's Moraine, the Niagara Escarpment, um, and other parts of Ontario, close to Lake Ontario, even going up more towards uh, Lake Simcoe and other areas. So maybe could you uh, speak on what does biodiversity conservation mean to you as an Indigenous environmentalist? Well, just building upon the <clears throat> conversation before uh, is, so the, the, other, the other interesting thing about um, the Greenbelt area is that it's also Carolinian forest. And where, like, if you look at a map of where the most species at risk are, it's actually in First Nation communities. So that would be Walpole Island has the most species at risk because they have the intact ecosystem and the Carolinian forest is so rare in Southern Ontario. So that's where you find actually the, the, and so they bear this inequitable burden in terms of keeping these species while everybody else continues to destroy. Um, so I did want to mention that, like, they, they have this, this unique um, Carolinian forest that supports these um, species, uh, these species that are also at risk. So in terms of what does biodiversity conversation mean to me, it means recognizing that fundamentally it's, it's moving away from that thinking that humans are separate from nature. That somehow, um, now having said that, there are some people who probably, sh- who probably um, I wouldn't want near nature because their idea of nature is that it's property, that it's a resource to exploit human for human gain. And therefore some nature, and you can do that too. And other nature, you don't. And that's the area that we would serve. And that's the area that would be um, protected from humans. But I think a biode- biodiversity conversa- uh, conservation is um, recognizing that humans are part of that conversation, that humans have a responsibility to caretake and be in relation to those particular areas and everything else that lives in there. Absolutely. Um, I'm from Southern Ontario, like Toronto, and 
It's considered one of the most developed biodiverse regions. It often has a lot of urbanization in it. Um, there is a lot of issues with like wildlife in Southern Ontario. Like how do we conserve it? How do we really protect it? Um, the green belt can help with that, but also I really find that indigenous conservation and like indigenous communities um, are also a huge part of that. Um, and like you said, humans are a real integral component of biodiversity. They're really a part of it. And I feel like that's the Eurocentric worldview. They really try to like governments and like Eurocentric politicians and everything. They try to keep us away from nature and they just see it as ownership, not stewardship. Um, so speaking of more like urban settings, what is conservation? What does it look like in an urban setting? I think it's, it looks similar actually. Um, so when I walk along or ride my bike along an area that they're trying to restore, so this would be sort of around Glendon, Sunnybrook Park, there's uh, uh, the Don River, the tributaries that run into it. So they, so it looks like they try to block off areas. So there's still very much that mentality. But at the same time, when people don't kind of understand those basic things, like how their kind of interventions or being in those kind of spaces is actually making things worse, even though they're there to try to enjoy nature, they actually, I think, don't even really know how to enjoy nature. Like, how do you enjoy nature at the same time that you're protecting it and stewarding it and being a caretaker of it? So I think I think there's still a lot of difficulty that folks have with um, with that. But I think there's increasing movement to try to recognize that people are an essential part of bio biodiversity and biological diversity. There's attempts to get people out there and interacting with and being in relation to, as opposed to being um, separate and it's a resource. I get to exploit it. I get to have my nature when I want it for this hour that I'm walking my dog and not think about it anymore, but to kind of try to be better towards what are the kind of restoration kind of activities can we do? What can I do as an individual and as a collective or part of um, or part of an organization? So in an urban setting, um, I will say that there's still a huge, there's equity and justice issues with that as well. So people of color aren't as, um, don't have access to the same green spaces and conserved spaces, like they know this. And uh, particularly in schools, like even in like when I'm riding my bike or walking along these spaces, it is very, it seems to be a very kind of white space. <laughs> so it's very hard for other peoples to be able to, so they're excluded from these spaces just because of equity and justice issues, like they don't have access to it. Um, or it's very controlled access through, um, Oh, uh, through ha maybe through a school trip or something like that, right? And because they tend to be like Sunnybrook tends to be in a very high income kind of neighborhood, and and they know this. Tree spaces, people are healthier there because of the the trees filter um, pollution and smog and um, heat. Like they, it doesn't get as hot in the summer when there's a heat wave. So there is inequity and injustice in terms of how people interact with a, in an urban setting, where are the green spaces, how they're gonna biologically conserve. So if you have no access, how do you even start to learn or gain a caretaking responsibility? So there's huge gaps in ter that, that to me in my mind relate to equity and justice. I totally agree. Um, I think in a lot of urban settings, it really is hard to get that equity and justice um, because there's so many different agendas happening within cities, municipalities. Um, a lot of times communities, like usually uh, marginalized communities are not heard in the urbanization efforts. And also even just environmental conservation workers like and people in the community, they're not, their voices are, it's hard for their voices to be listened to. Um, and I think the green belt is, it's a safeguard. It kind of mitigates definitely effects of development um it really is able to have um protect adverse species and it's able to at least give some areas even though there could be more definitely areas in like toronto or like um or even niagara like closer to there where there could be more protected wildlife um how do you think urbanization of the green belt or just in southern ontario has it affected the movement of wildlife i think it's affected their movement for sure and if people if people don't know how to relate to wildlife, whatever whatever the wildlife is, birds, um, especially migratory birds or animals, then there is an increase in what they call like human wildlife conflict, right? 
Um, so in a place like Toronto, when people see a coyote, oh my God, that's just so terrifying. And I'm thinking, like, I can't even imagine how terrifying it would be for the coyote. Like there's cars around, um, animals get diseases from people and their pets because they don't take, because people don't even take care of their pets properly. Um, so, so I do think it affects wildlife, it affects wildlife a lot. Even if people don't know, they're just being, I think a lot of the times they're just really ignorant because they, because they don't realize that they have responsibilities and obligations. So they, they just think that the green belt, the green space is just for their use. They don't recognize that it's actually a relationship that needs to be cultivated. You have to make it your business to know what's the ecology of the region. Um, you should be thrilled to be able to see actual wildlife, fox and coyotes or other animals as opposed to being terrified. Uh, so I do, I do find that like when I walk around, people are, I saw a coyote over there. It's just terrifying. I'm like, it was running away from you. Like, do you, like people have so, they're so ignorant about how wildlife actually, how, how wildlife actually interact in the spaces that they're in that they, they just assume they're like the enemy. They, there, there isn't really that, um, that real, there really isn't a caretaking or responsibility kind of um relationship with them now having said that there are engos there are conservation groups there are people who are trying to develop those relationships and educate but really for the most part i think people haven't figured out how urban sprawl how development how paving everything um impacts wildlife like basically you just you 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 just destroyed the home of a bunch of animals like whatever birds are living in the trees but no and not even a consideration of what that means. And then wondering why whatever animals were there have more concentrated and smaller spaces to try to live in, why there might be more human uh, wildlife um, conflict or interactions. Definitely, like I think for the green belt, um, one thing that I find very interesting is that even though I'm not really in the green belt where I go to in Toronto, but there's, um, there's train tracks near um you know the house I usually go to and um my family's dog like we walk there's like a park and then there's coyotes that live in this train tracks like on that area and there was one time where my dog like my mom saw the coyote but my dog didn't and yeah it's like there's this there's this fear that a lot of people have they see things like that they don't understand that um they are more afraid of you or they're more afraid of the the urban sprawl or something rather than just seeing you as a human, I feel like um, that's something I've been reading about, like for indigenous teachings, there's a lot of teachings where it's like animals and humans actually had to work together. Um, But now in like the settler colonial era, you don't really see that. You don't see that understanding. Since the rise of really human settlement, there's definitely been, climate change has obviously been a huge issue. Biodiversities have been lost, migration, like habitats become really unsurvivable um, due to like, like urbanization projects that are happening. Um, do you think this proximity of settlement, like between indigenous and non-indigenous people, like does it affect distribution of resources maybe? So distribution of resources. So people who who are developers, people who have wealth and privilege are going to reap a lot of the resources as opposed to people who are marginalized um, and face, or who are marginalized and vulnerable, um, particularly I would have to point out also Indigenous peoples, because really, Southern Ontario is the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples, and you're not really having a say in terms of what's happening there. So it's, it's either the traditional territories, or there's treaties, or people still have an interest in, um, in what's happening in the green belt, but they're not, but they're looked at as interest groups. They're not really looked at as rights holders, or people who actually want to govern and be part of um, decision making in the green belt they're just uh, some people that we have to talk to because we want to build this highway or have this development they're not really um, engaged as um, leaders and as people who had authority and jurisdiction like when indigenous peoples had authority and jurisdiction and governed and lived in what would be called the green belt area it was biologically diverse it was people live there and you know, you didn't have 100 species at risk. So there's something about Indigenous people's governance in, in the territories or in the Greenbelt area that that would be really helpful for 
um, biological um, conservation. Definitely. I think um, Southern Ontario, like for treaties, I feel like there's a lot of, um, when we talk about treaties in Ontario or like any real, any region really, um, it's often seen as like an artifact rather than actual law, actual mm -hmm. governance. Like it's really, there's that um, interpretation that is like a huge injustice to Indigenous populations in Ontario or like in any region um, that they're home to. And that's something I've seen where in McGill, like there's really no treaties there. It's really like a huge narrative of conquest. And it's really frustrating because there's so much urban sprawl in Montreal and like Mont Royal and like there's um I don't think in terms of tourism it's as I feel like in Toronto there's a specific element of tourism that comes into play when we talk about like certain parks or like areas of wildlife and like urban settings um so like we said humans have this huge role in conservation in biodiversity do you think there's any responsible tourism in the green belt i think there is if, if you want to call like hiking like let's say the bruce trail which goes all the way down through the niagara escarpment um that that i see that a lot more being promoted and i have to say that with the pandemic when really the only kind of safe place to be around other people was outside that there was an increased number of people who um who wanted to go outside who wanted to be around the beaches who wanted to be in those kind of spaces um, but I do know that there were stories that where people didn't know how to do that. Like they didn't know how to, if you go into these spaces, you have to um, take your garbage. <laughs> you don't litter up the beach. Um, you know, like there were municipalities, I know it was a First Nation um, in a green belt area who had to close their beach because pe people people really wanted to connect with, with nature. They really wanted to, um, If you like to me, that's how I'm thinking about this kind of tourism. But they didn't know how to be like they didn't know how to do it in a in a good way even though they they wanted to they had no idea how to do it people started to kind of turn to nature and the outdoors and green spaces um, during the pandemic because it was safe um, what i hope people do is they continue that but learn how to be in those kind of spaces respectfully and not make a mess and not leave your garbage and you know kind of recognize there's appropriate ways to be in those spaces and um, but we need to teach that to people because they don't know where, where they're going to access that. Right. Definitely. Um, when you speak of, I think, the pandemic and um, nature and wildlife, I remember in first lockdown, um, my mom and me, we were like really referencing um, the there was a Panas article that was saying how during the lockdowns, there was a global air pollution decline. And that's something that was really interesting because um, I didn't really think of like pollution and air quality and like kind of how um, that was before, because I feel like, like before the pandemic, I was, um, it was all about just school and like, just like a general, like domestic routine. There wasn't really a lot of nature incorporated in my life. Or if there was like going to a park, I didn't really think about those things. But since the pandemic has started, like I've gone on so many walks, I've gone on, I've done more foraging, like it's been it's easier because yeah, outside you feel kind of safer, like because of the air quality indoors. And we were told about that. That's definitely um, a reason to be more aware about biodiversity and like pollution and that just, like those types of things. So I guess I'm going to ask you now about um, like ecosystems and how um, there's often a disruption that occurs, like a new ecosystem is, uh, there's a new arrival in it. And two ecosystems can be impacted um when we talk about predator prey or like life cycles and ecosystems maybe what do you have to say about the effects of climate change and does it impact species endangered species i mean i think one of the ways that people think about it is how habitat and how ecosystems are impacted so what what a what a species might need in order to survive or flourish in a particular ecosystem like all of that's going to impact the habitat and well-being of a particular whatever they are, whether they're fish, whether they're birds, whether they're animals. I think the other challenge that comes is when you, um, is when you, so for example, ticks, people see a lot more of those now, or different species getting into the Great Lakes um, that affect the fish, different insects that are coming that, uh, like, so for example, 
probably more so in Northern Ontario is a gypsy moth. So those are invasive that came from, um, they came from Europe and then they were brought to the United States, but because it's been warmer, they're getting further North and because their, their eggs or their larvae don't get killed because the winters aren't cold enough. They just decimate everything. It affects, affects everything because it's um, hotter because there's no leaves on the trees because they eat all the leaves. So these kind of species, they, they, they impact an ecosystem and a habitat, not just even a single species. So any one of these can impact a whole number of species um, in different ways. So climate change has been really um, uh, devastating in terms of different, um, in terms of species at risk or endangered species. And so there's all kinds of different ways that um, species, even those that aren't endangered, that are impacted by climate change. Uh, in terms of the ecosystem, their habitat, um, and being outcompeted for food, or just being killed um, by, by some of these uh, some of these other species that are moving north because of the, the because of the climate uh, changing and being more accommodating for them. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, since when I was doing a bit of my own research for um, the green belt and like different species in it. There's been some like records from the ROM, like historical ones that show many species of fish are actually moving up to more northern wa waters, which used to be too cold for them. And with the green belt, I feel like this can also help kind of um, like keep track of these type of patterns for species. Definitely biodiversity, humans are so impacted by it. There's like a huge, um, like from the air, the food, the water, um, we're all like impacted by biodiversity loss, humans, animals. Um, all species, um, like in terms of, yeah, like air quality, um, like if there's no fruits or nuts without bees to pollinate, like if there's crashing food systems and there's many more um, and even interactions with ecosystems that are complex, um, it can lead to like real long-term fast spreading impacts. Um, so what would you say maybe to others who aren't aware of biodiversity's influence on well-being? I think I would say that Climate change, I'm going to put this in the context of climate change, isn't going to go away. And what we do know is that, because um, this happened when there was the heat wave in Montreal, is that the people who didn't have access to green space or where there wasn't like canopy from trees, and they were the ones who suffered the most. That's where most of the deaths were. Um, so there's a science to show this. You, you need to have it in order, like, well, literally to survive when these um, dramatic sort of weather events occur. Um, we also know that, you know, being outside uh, and being looking at a distance because we're spending so much time in front of a screen is actually really, really bad for your eyes and really, really bad for your brain over time because you need certain kinds of light in the daylight outside and you know, and then when you're in nature at night, it's dark because it should be dark. So it, it actually helps people, um, I guess, regulate sort of your regular sleep wake kind of cycle being outside and being in green space and biodiversity can help with that. The people cannot be healthy if the planet isn't and the planet isn't going to be healthy if people aren't because of that relationship, that close relationship there. And biodiversity is a huge um, is a huge part of that. And it's very much tied to our, um, very much tied to our well-being. Even if we're sitting inside and we're not necessarily interacting with what we might call, what I'm calling biodiversity is, let's say, nature, the natural world, you're still benefiting from it because you're still eating from it. You're still breathing the air. So even if you're not aware of it, you still are benefiting from it. And the more there is of it, the more, um, I think, collective, individual, um, and community well-being that there'll be an ideally planetary well-being because really the planet is being threatened right now. Um, it's not going well. And so if it doesn't go well for the planet, it's not going to go well for us as people. I agree. I think forming like more personal connections with nature and learning about the species are just some of the ways that like Ontario's, Ontarians and like other um and humans can really just begin to engage in nature, understand um, why we need to promote, protect biodiversity and how just like um, exploring what green, the Greenbelt has to offer, voicing their concerns about um, the lack of protection plans. Um, there are many ways to get involved that I've found, like there's citizen science programs, there's 
you can track distribution like trends and species um like you can so you can understand kind of how wildlife interacts how species interact with um urban sprawl or anything like that um so can you maybe describe what it means maybe to form from like an indigenous perspective even to like form more personal connections to nature one of the things I do in my teaching is just send people outside and learn how to listen to nature. What do you see? This time of year is quite dramatic. Like I had my class do this. So what they're hearing and seeing outside in January is different than now. Like right now there's different birds. You actually can hear them all day. I didn't, let's say, hear them at two o'clock in the afternoon when it was minus 35 outside. <laughs> but now I do. So I think getting people to start connecting um, to the natural world Again, even if you're kind of inside, some people were scared to go outside. Some people as part of the pandemic, you can still see the moon. You can still see the sun and and develop some kind of understanding um, and relationship with them as well. So to me, um, that people are able to do that. To, what, the, one of the ways that I try to try to do it in teaching as an educator is through the land acknowledgement. So it doesn't matter where you are in the green belt, it's going to be different, whether you're um, more southwest or more southeast um, in the green belt, if that makes any sense. And because what, what you're saying in the land acknowledgement is you're acknowledging the people. So you need to know there were indigenous people there and they caretake the land. They were taking care of it. And you and I are descendants of that. So I remind, I ask people, what kind of ancestor are you going to be? Are you, how are you going to caretake this land for future generations? How are you going to relate to the non-human world? So land acknowledgement isn't just, these are the people that were here. You don't even know who they are, like Haudenosaunee. What does that even mean? Like it's actually six nations. Do you, like, what are the treaties that were here? Because what the treaties do is they lay out people's behavior in the area. Like how are you supposed to behave in this particular area? But it's also the non-human world, the land, the animals, land as a capital L as having agency and having a say like mother earth kind of thing so that they start to understand that the natural world is actually very personal as well. Like they have a personal relationship, but these other entities can also have a relationship with you as well. It's not one way. So I think that's one thing that I always try to remind people to do is, um, is, is to understand that this actually requires you to connect to the natural world and learn how to listen to the natural world. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, definitely for me, um, I've been practicing more of like rekindling indigenous understandings of seasons and wildlife and mm -hmm. how we can like that circular relationship, that communal relationship with wildlife, um, where if you do take, um, if you like hunt moose meat or any type of meat, or you always put tobacco down, you always make a spirit plate, those type of things. Like if you're having a feast, I made recently, I did a bear moon feast in February. Um, we had like moose meat, wild rice, the whole thing, um, super bannock. And it was a really nice community thing we did because we had community stuff, all really pretty local resources, like food supply. Um, and it was just like a really nice, like ceremonial thing to do with indigenous youth in Montreal and a few non-indigenous youth who are really, um, they're really respectful, appreciate what we're doing and they're they're in the movements in their own way um and i think it was really interesting the 13 grandmother moons for anishinaabe teachings um is the one i've been using and i'm actually going to go get sap in this month as well um and try and get that from sugar moon so definitely having that real personal connection i feel like from an indigenous perspective is even more because like land acknowledgements right it's like um not only do we we all should like it should be mandatory now i mean i find it shocking that there's like still some organizations that don't have it um and it's just really frustrating it's like that's bare minimum i think for acknowledging indigenous like conservation and stewardship um but that's kind of my own way i form personal connections and i love like yeah what ancestor are we going to be like are we going to be repeating colonialism or are we actually going to be unlearning and are we actually going to um engage reconnect as well as like live in the present too um so i guess just to finish off um how can maybe residents of within the green belt indigenous non-indigenous um protect conservation of wildlife and plants in their backyard for example planting identifying species that type of thing 
think other than than going out for walks in different spaces and trying to learn from the natural world, like that's how I would frame it. You're trying to learn from the from the natural world itself using your senses and paying attention. Is I do think if you have the capacity, you have the space to to grow, then you're going to start to see bizarre insects that hadn't been there before. And because it's actually a season, like literally you can see what happens in the spring and what happens in the fall, what tends to arrive, um, you know, at different times of the year, things that I hadn't seen before, things I saw last summer that I hadn't seen before, like a showing up in, in the garden because of the growing season, like theoretically, like it's actually kind of short. Um, how do you, like what I've done with my backyard, worked with some folks at York who are trying to recover pollinators because they're really impacted by climate change and pesticides and everything else. So, um, so it looked kind of wild. Like I, you have to let go of the idea that you're going to have a nice little manicured lawn and just go, okay, I'm just going to let it kind of look like this because it's actually going to support um, pollinators and like, and insects. Like we actually need to have insects. A lot of people spend a lot of time trying to eradicate them and uh, that you actually need to have them. You don't start cleaning your yard till a certain time when they've woken up and they're starting to fly around. A lot of people start shoving all these um, things in whatever they're kind of bags, those yard waste bags. So I leave mine alone until, you know, 10 or 12 degrees when they start waking up and they're flying around and then, then you can start um, tidying up. But I just, I just worked with folks and then tried, some of it was already there like goldenrod, and tried to grow the plants that were actually going to support the pollinators, which in turn support the garden anyway, support butterflies, support hummingbirds, support bees. So I just started to um, grow different things. And it means you have to like think about your space in a different way. You have to think about it as a shared space. It's not like my property and I'm going to do this. It's like, no, actually it's a shared space. Different things. We're actually encroaching on top of other beings space. Like that's urban sprawl. Like that's what we're doing. That's what cities do. So I think it, it requires a different kind of attitude. And there are things that people can do, even if you don't um, have the opportunity of having a backyard, you know, a balcony. You can still grow things. You can participate in community gardens. There's one year I am. I went there and picked raspberries one year, because um, nobody was picking them. <laughs> and so, uh, so I think there's different ways that people can contribute. Um, and participate. And I think what it does is it allows you to pay attention. Um, it allows you to just go, you know what, from year to year, this was a really hot summer. I had to, like, I have rain barrels. Um, I had to, like, water the garden a lot more. So then you start to notice changes that maybe you wouldn't have paid attention to if you weren't growing things. Um, and growing things anybody can do any age, little kids, older people, um, and, you, and you pay attention to what's happening there. Um, and not only are you sharing the space, um, recognize that squirrels and skunks and whatnot aren't your enemy. Like expect that we are in their territory. I had to, I had to make my peace with squirrels and um, cause there's four of them and they're very territorial. They keep the other ones away. And so, and so they, they're gonna raid the garden sometimes, right? Cause as far as they're concerned, it's their garden and I'm the one who's encroaching. Um, so I think it's like having a different kind of attitude towards um, growing things and who you're sharing that with and recognizing that humans are the ones that are encroaching all over like different wildlife, all over the bees, all over the butterflies, places that they would be growing and thriving and raising, raising their young, if that makes any sense. Oh, definitely. It definitely makes so much sense. I think I love encroachment, the word of that, because for me, like when I've walked my dog before, you know, dogs are all about squirrels. A lot of them, they love chasing them. And I didn't think before, I'm like, hmm, maybe the squirrel doesn't like this. Maybe the squirrel <laughs> would rather not be chased and just like be in the park and get what it needs. Um, so definitely being more mindful of like when I'm interacting, even if just squirrels or anything um, to kind of not encroach too much in their space really. Um, so I don't let the dog get like in their space that much anymore or just generally like when I'm, out in the community or in nature. I really think about those things a lot more. Um, but thank you so much for sharing today. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up for today? Um, I think a key to biodiversity is 
um, supporting Indigenous people and their way of life, and even thinking about things like language revitalization as part of that. So a lot of what we see with the United Nations and other spaces, like I mentioned in Canada, really where most of the species at risk are, is in First Nation communities. Like that's where they are most of the most of the time in Canada. And what they found is Indigenous peoples caretake about 20% of the world's landmass, but that's where 80% of the biodiversity is. So Indigenous people are doing something, right, that the rest of the planet are not. Like, and, uh, and the other thing about those spaces, that 20% that Indigenous peoples um, caretake, for lack of a better word, manage or control, some people would say, uh, but I say caretake and steward, or that's where 80% of the biodiversity is on the planet, is also where uh, most Indigenous languages are spoken. So there's a connection there that people are starting to kind of figure out. So to me, I see, you know, supporting Indigenous language revitalization, language efforts, cultural revitalization is critical for biodiversity. It's, it's good at every single level, um, including internationally and for planetary health. So hopefully that's food for thought. Um, and I appreciate having this conversation with you and meeting you. For sure. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm so glad we were able to have you on this podcast and this interview. Um, I think, yeah, your knowledge has been really amazing. Um, even though I'm more in like the history field, more that type of, it was nice to get like environmental science type of perspective on biodiversity and indigenous stewardship. Thank you, Deborah McGregor, for taking the time to share insightful perspectives with us. And thank you, our audience, for joining us in this established episode. If you like what you hear, check out our work at Shake of the Establishment. You can find us on our website or Instagram to continue learning about important topics like environmental stewardship, social justice issues, and political accountability. That's S-H-A-K-E-U-P-T-H-E-E-S-T-A-B dot O-R-G. And find us under the same name on Instagram. To learn more about the Greenbelt, visit the Greenbelt Foundation online.